Good. Right. Well, I'm not seeing any more people ready to uh, come in, so uh, I think we'll get going right away. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. My name is Liz Lilly, and uh, I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Wasanich peoples. And welcome to the second conversation in our series, A New Politics for BC, Neoliberalism and Beyond. As we said last week, in these sessions, we're exploring the current political landscape and the underlying economic drivers to identify not just what is broken, but why it's broken and the challenges to fixing it. And we should be discussing our green vision for the future of politics in British Columbia. As we said last week, we welcome members, supporters, and anyone else who cares about the future of this province and planet. Last week, we talked about finding hope and the importance of a positive and hopeful message amid the many challenges. And we heard from Sonia who talked about her, the story, and how, who talked about how the story we tell shapes our perceptions of reality and how the story that places individualism as the hero and government as the enemy has led to the breakdown of some key relationships, especially between people and government. And she talked about how the commodification of everything under the current neoliberal paradigm is leaving so many people behind witness how many people are coming um, housing insecure due to the commodification of housing. And we're doing this, uh, this, these sessions using George Monbiot's book, uh, Out of the Wreckage. And in that he makes a call for a new story or paradigm to replace neoliberalism. And Sonia said that we need to build a community connection and create the conditions for collective well-being. We also heard from Thomas Homer Dixon last week on the importance of a new story and the importance of hope in changing the future. But his call for hope is hope with action because he says, hope without action will just contribute to a hopeless ending, but commanding hope can turn any one of us into the next hero. So the hopeful story has to have action associated with it for the future. Today, we're going to unpack the neoliberal story in more detail. We're going to look at the impact of the neoliberal paradigm on politics and economics in BC today, how it shaped our economy and its institutions, and how it's resulted in so many of the problems we see today. You know, it's amazing that so many people look confused when you talk or I talk about neoliberalism. After all, it's been the dominant economic and political paradigm for the last 40 years. So generations of British Columbians know nothing else, and they think that this is the national, natural order of things. But it's a bit like living in the Soviet Union and not knowing what communism is. So if you've not heard of neoliberalism, you're not alone. In fact, I talked to my neighbor about it the other day, and I said, yeah, we're gonna be talking about neoliberalism. And she looked at me, and she's a former principal of a, a school, and she said, what's neoliberalism? So after, after this evening, so if you've not heard of it, you're not alone. If this evening, you're going to find it everywhere. Um, until recently, it was heresy to challenge neoliberal prescriptions. And to be honest, it is a simple, easily digestible story that they put out there. And a large population, a portion of the population think that policy prescriptions are perfectly reasonable. It's only when you look beneath the surface and examine what the real outcomes are that you see the fatal and destructive flaws of neoliberalism. But enough from me. Uh, I'm now going to turn this over to Joanne Roberts, who will be our moderator tonight, and will introduce our guests. Okay. <clears throat> I am Joanne Roberts, but I'm not letting Liz leave yet. Uh, I think we need to, to understand, Liz, a little bit about how much of your fascination with neoliberalism has led to this series. Um, and, and Liz is qualified to talk about it. I just want to back that up. Um, not only did she work for Margaret Thatcher, and I think that probably qualifies anybody to talk about neoliberalism, uh, but she also was trained as an economist and has a bachelor's degree from the University of Bristol in England and a master's degree in economics uh, from the University of Alberta, which is also a degree that one of our guests has tonight. Um, so this is something that you've been fascinated uh, with for a long time, Liz. And it was your frustration, I would say, with um, certain politicians that led you to the Green Party and to retirement. 
So before we go on, can I ask you something that you just said? You described neoliberalism as the enemy. Why do you see it as an enemy? Well, I think in simple terms, I, I see it as an enemy of a just and sustainable planet, but I think we'll go into that a little bit later. When I talk about an enemy, I'm not seeing two armies on a battlefield. It's more insidious than that. It's how neoliberalism has waged a stealth campaign to normalize itself in people's minds. I've also likened it to a disease that people don't even know that they have. Um, until we understand the enemy or the disease, we don't know how to counter it. So when people say, why have I never heard of neoliberalism? It's because those with a vested interest in neoliberalism don't want you to know about it. Because if you did, you might not like it and do something about it. So if we're going to develop a new story or a new politics to replace neoliberalism, we need to know what neoliberalism is in the first place so that we know what we're replacing it with. And we hopefully it'll have a title that isn't quite as difficult to say as neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> but you talked about, uh, you know, those with a vested interest in neoliberalism. That sounds a little bit like conspiracy theories to me. I mean, when you talk about these vested interests, who are you talking about? Well, it does sound a bit conspiratorial, but you can follow the money. You can follow the money. And there's a fairly clear path that ultimately leads to the world's wealthiest individuals, financial institutions and industrial interests that have been the primary beneficiaries of neoliberalism. And frankly, they want it to stay that way. A lot of books that talk about this. There's um, one I read recently was one called Evil Geniuses by Kurt and Anderson. And if you look at the work of um, George Lakoff, his uh, political brain and don't think of an elephant, they talk about how the, the money from these um, vested interests have been poured into think tanks and university chairs. Uh, you know, and you, when you look at the amount of money that the oil and gas industry in particular has put into these institutions to get the neoliberal message right, to get people on side. And, you know, the research, the, the, these think tanks have done a lot of research into human psychology, so that even the language we use reinforces the neoliberal message. Um, the most famous one that I come across is the term tax relief. Um, tax relief suggests that tax is a pain that you need to be relieved of, rather than that it's money that goes to buy essential services and goods for the population. And it's interesting that at universities in North America, Ecological economics, which is a legitimate subject, it's not taught in the economics department, because if it was taught in the economics department, then some tenured professors are going to find their life's work at, at, uh, at risk. And it might, it might be academic suicide to accept that there is an alternative to standard neoclassical economic theory. These people have very deep pockets, and it's very hard for progressive think, think tanks to compete financially or to have the means to put out an alternative message when so much of the media is controlled by these vested interests. All right, Liz, you know what? I think we're very fortunate because our next speaker uh, is someone who maybe wisely is not hanging out in the economics department, but has moved over to political science. So he can talk about what we want him to talk about tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Justin Lifeso, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Victoria. Um, Justin grew up on Treaty 4 territory uh, in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And uh, he does have his PhD and his MA from the University of Alberta. That's the link to you, Liz. Um, and his, uh, he has his uh, BA from the University of Regina. And before pursuing his academic career, he served as a public servant in Saskatchewan, working for the Ministry of Health and also the uh, officer of the provincial auditor. I think it gives Justin, as we will hear, a very practical look at what he has to talk about tonight. And, and, and he has written a number of things on this, but some of the topics that interested me anyway, when I looked at his very long uh, CV is uh, in 2017, he uh, presented at a 
conference, Neoliberalism and Its Crisis. And uh, his lecture was Lean on Everything, Neoliberalism and the Emergence of Lean Management in North America. I'm sorry I wasn't there to hear that. But one of the reasons Justin is with us tonight is Liz, who has an antenna for everything neoliberal, went to a public lecture that Justin was giving. And this, this series had already been planned. And she called me up and she said, guess what? We have a professor in Victoria that specializes in neoliberalism. And um, yeah, we couldn't wait to talk to him. So welcome, Justin. It's good to have you with us. So nice to be here. Thank you so much. You know, we, we talk a lot about neoliberalism in a kind of an academic way, but I want to start with you. I had a chance to talk to you a little bit about growing up in Saskatchewan and your family growing up on a farm. Is your interest in neoliberalism rooted very much? Is it personal for you? Did you see neoliberalism and maybe the not so nice side of it at work in your own family? Well, yeah, I mean, Liz said that neoliberalism has been the dominant paradigm for 40 years, and I'm 40 years old. Um, so, you know, my life uh, corresponds with it pretty, pretty neatly, actually. And the funny thing is, I didn't actually grow up on the farm because we lost the farm. Um, you know, we were on the farm until I was five. And one of the, you know, big store, one of the sort of... Uh, tent poles in the story of neoliberalism is the interest rate hikes in the early 1980s um, that were instigated by uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve and Paul Volcker, who was very much a, 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 um, adherent to neoliberal thought. And, you know, my family couldn't make a go of it like many people once, once interest rates were high. And um, then my life for the next 20 years or so wasn't particularly pleasant in Saskatchewan. Um, the, you know, in Saskatchewan, as in British Columbia at the time, as in uh, Ontario, there were NDP governments, ostensibly social democratic governments, who had very much bought in either willfully or, or, or non-willfully um, into what we call third way social democracy, which is essentially just neoliberalism with a labor face in the UK, a Democrat face in the UK, and they are in the US, and a uh, NDP or liberal face um, in Canada. And yeah, so, you know, my we, we moved into Moose Jaw from Crane Valley, Saskatchewan, which now has a population of eight people. And um, my mom um, had a number of jobs, as, as, as my dad did. They kind of moved around trying to find work as we could because there wasn't a lot of work in Saskatchewan at the time. Uh, and when the NDP reformed, you know, social services at the time, they sent my mom a 50-something you know, um, farm wife to go back to school right for um to learn how to be an administrative assistant which is you know fine but it was just an example of okay we're not going to take care of you um you're going to take care of yourself everybody has to be a self uh, sufficient entrepreneurial sort of individual and so when I, it's time to go to university at uh, uh, regina 20 years ago 22 years ago now um you know, it was an opportunity for me to locate myself in a story. And I, and so understanding the context of what was happening around me. And so between my training at the U of R and then um, as a public servant um, at the university, or, and then at the University of Alberta through my graduate programs, and now here at UVic and through my research, uh, I continue to write and teach about neoliberalism and Canadian politics. Um, it's been locating myself in that story um and you know i i invite my students to because they are by, by and large younger than i am um and again like like liz said don't necessarily um she mentioned george um Monbiot and he said he wrote a piece about neoliberalism a few years ago in the guardian he said imagine if the, nobody in the soviet union had ever heard of communism and so for those of us who grew up in the time, who didn't see the shift that happened in the late 70s, early 1980s, particularly those um, that are younger than me that have been living their lives in crisis for the last 20 years, 
you know, th there's there's not a vocabulary sometimes to put on the sort of ideas that have been driving the politics of Western liberal democracies for 40 years. So let's start there. <clears throat> Did someone one day, let's go to the roots of neoliberalism in yeah. our current context. Did someone one day just think it's time we became neoliberals? I mean, we could name some of the big names, but I'm wondering how did neoliberalism make its way in, into North America in such a pervasive way? It is an enormously complex question. Um, uh, sorry, I mean, you know, I'm going to be a professor -y and say that there's no easy answer to this, but okay. um, depending on where you live, it probably appeared somewhere more obviously somewhere in the mid 1980s you you, start, you know if you remember you probably started to see something like that right or maybe even the late 70s if you're in the uk the thatcher appearing definitely seems like something or reagan in the us or mulroney here but it's really difficult to put a tight neat and tidy pin in where it begins because the ideas that emerged as dominant eventually you know had been around for a great deal longer they had been being developed and promoted by a um marginalized group of economists that are uh, organized in a number of different sort of venues but most uh notably the Mont Pelerin Society, which is this, the name they gave themselves, and it was this network of academics, and it was led by Friedrich von Hayek. Its members included um, Ludwig von Mises, uh, Milton Friedman, who's probably, he and Hayek are the two most well-known, a uh, bunch of economists from the University of Chicago, the London School of Economics, the University of Freiburg in Germany, and the University of Vienna. Um, and they hated, I can't stress this enough, the post-war consensus, the sort of Keynesian welfareist, you know, the state has a role to play in evening out the jagged edges of capitalism and ensuring that people who do fall the cracks, fall through the cracks, are caught by some sort of social safety net. They saw it as a massive intrusion of the state into the lives of individuals. And for them, the individual is really all that matters. Um, that is the unit of analysis and that is the unit of life that should be we, we should care about the most and but they were marginalized they, they were out there screaming into the void saying this is awful you know they they said it was you know Hayek said it was the road to serfdom he said it was you know essentially the same sort of interventions into life that led to the third reich whereas Friedman who's of course writing in mid 20th century the U.S. is using the Soviet Union as a boogeyman and largely they are ignored because departments of economics in universities around the world at this point are largely Keynesian, as well as departments of finance in governments across Western liberal democracies. But then, then the floor sort of falls out of that consensus in the 1970s with a series of uh, crises, right? You've got the, the Vietnam War, you know, depletes um, the resources of the United States. Eventually, the United States leaves the gold standard. I won't get into like all of the, the details about this. Then there's stagflation. And stagflation, and the, the oil shocks, the, the right. massive rise in price of, of oil and gasoline. And then stagflation, which is the uh, combination of high prices what, with low economic growth. And so there's a crisis in the 1970s where the old ways aren't working. And lo and behold, there are these fellows, and they're almost always men, who have been sort of making sure that they are the ones who have were offering a diagnosis of the crisis as well as solutions for the crisis. And so increasingly, they, um, uh, elected officials are turning to them for their ideas. Margaret Thatcher was a great fan of, of Hayek, wrote letters to him upon what, uh, thanking him for his work when she was uh, when she was elected in the United Kingdom. 
And then from there, it takes like 10 or 20 years for things to really crystallize in terms of public policy, the privatization, the deregulation, the trade liberalization, and the cuts. The cuts don't really hit across the board in Canada until the mid-90s, which is a liberal government, not a conservative government. So uh, that's a, a very brief but winding, long, windy um, history of how it got to be what it is. But what is interesting to me <clears throat> is you say, you have these group of academics, these economists who, <clears throat> you know, led by Hayek and Friedman, who basically are sitting around talking about what we now call neoliberalism, their ideas, let's get government, let's get the state out of all of this, let the market run things, this is their, this is their mantra, and they've written about it, and they're talking about it. they're just waiting for someone to listen to them. They mm -hmm. have a story ready. So now my next question is to you. So we follow their story, and the market is happy, and people are making profits, and you know, big business is making profits, and people are getting poorer and falling through the cracks, just our medical system starts to fall apart. But in 2008, much like happened back in 1970, we have the crisis and neoliberalism falls apart. I mean, you know, when, when we have uh, the mortgage crisis and when we see, you know, the banks failing and whatnot, there doesn't seem to be another group of academics sitting around with pamphlets and an idea, or is there and we just haven't heard about it? What do you think? Why didn't I mean, there's, uh, do them in? <laughs> there's a lot of alternatives, but I think that, um, you know, I think Liz was right when she talked about um, vested interests. And it does sound conspiratorial at times, particularly when we're sitting here in this sort of era of dangerous conspiracy theories. But, you know, um, business interests were around for that whole story. It, uh, you know, Hayek, his position at the University of Chicago was paid for by the Volcker Foundation, which is a, a private foundation that was started as a philanthropic thing. And then the guy who started it had died. And then his nephew was a, a libertarian activist and started using it to um, to promote libertarian causes. Uh, Ludwig von Mises at uh, City University of New York, his position was paid for by corporate interests. Um, the, it was the the Mont Pelerin Society itself. Its conference, what its first conference, was paid for by Credit Suisse. So there's there are well healed uh, folks who believe strongly in the free market. Whether or not you know they recognize that essentially they're just protecting their own interests, I, that's not for me to say. But when the financial crisis hit. You know, there was a moment where it didn't look like alternatives could arrive. There was real questions about whether or not, you know, you had then you had Occupy Wall Street and there was all this sort of uh, uh, um, attention and demand for some sort of alternatives. And then when Obama is elected, you know, he starts hiring economic advisors who believe in the same old stuff. And, you know, for whatever reason, that wasn't the same sort of flashpoint that has come before and you know the maybe in time in 50 years we'll look back in hindsight like i'm doing now about the 1970s and say that it started then because i think at that this point you know the 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 fabric of neoliberalism is certainly coming unspooled um we are there are alternatives some of them are deeply concerning anti-democratic but they are offering up alternatives and it could be that in 50 years when we look back it could have been like okay well it started at this point with the financial crisis and then you know the 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 the, the, the next decade was one of kind of like stumbling from solution to solution until uh covid kind of finished off that process and brought in uh, a new sort of moment in time where anything seems possible for better or for worse I guess, you know, and we're not immune in Canada, as we know. I mean, uh, you were pointing out to me when we first met that the Fraser Institute brought Milton Friedman, Friedman to Canada in the 1980s. They did. They, did. They, they, they introduced him to Bill Bennett. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now I, I'm wondering, okay, let's say there was a crack in neoliberalism in 2008, but 
someone put glue on it and kept it together. Um, are we seeing our healthcare crisis? Um, our, certainly our climate crisis, are they starting to, and the huge gap in income, I mean, we're, we're watching the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. Is that starting to wear it down much like, um, you know, we wore down the old message, the new deal, if we can call it that in the post-war era, do you think? I mean, are you seeing the unraveling is what I'm getting at? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. But I, what comes next won't be, like, it's not like a tidal wave that sweeps away everything that exists and there's a new world that's born, right? You know, in, ni you know, in 19, even after 1995, with all the enormous budget cuts that happened, we still have the Canada Pension Plan. We still have oh. hospitals, all sorts of things. Like, you can't just sweep away. So it's not so much imagining a, a, a fresh a blank slate and a fresh new start it is what emerges how are things formed and reformed how does this moment transition and transform into the next what survives and what doesn't and so i see that moment absolutely happening now right well i mean we're having this conference and i i see we have over a hundred people here and That's I, great. It's amazing because when we said we were going to hold a series to look at the new politics and neoliberalism, there were some skeptics, I have mm -hmm. to say. Um, and we do know that other organizations are starting to have this kind of conversation. Uh, so, Justin, I'm going to stop that now and thank yep. you for that wonderful history lesson, I think, in neoliberalism and where it starts the question you have raised is okay what's going to replace it and we don't know that yet um that's the discussion i would like us to move on to as we bring our panel back together so uh justin's going to stay with us liz is going to stay with us and i am now i presume adam's here i can't see him on my screen but he is here okay good uh we're going to invite adam olson uh the green mla for Saanich north and the islands first elected in 2017. He is uh, the house leader for the BC Green Party. Uh, and, you know, Adam has served as a can, uh, Central Saanich councillor. He's a small business owner. Uh, he was born and raised on the Startlip First Nation in Brentwood Bay and is a member of that nation. And one of the things, at least in Canada, that I think we need to examine if we're looking at our story as Canadians and the new story we want to tell is to start with the story of our First Nations. And uh, so, Adam, I would like to talk about neoliberalism and its relationship to colonialism in the context of Indigenous knowledge. And I am not asking you to speak on behalf of every Indigenous community, but I hope well, you can thank help. thank goodness. <laughs> but I would like to talk about that discussion, that intersection. Yeah. Um, do you think neoliberalism and colonialism have had an impact? And can we learn, and are they having an impact still on indigenous uh, nations? Well, I, I wanna, I think it's important to, uh, oh, yeah, so yes, the short answer is yes, but I'm a politician. So now here's the long answer. And and I, and I, I kind of wanna go back and just uh, maybe start at the beginning a little bit because Justin provided Kind of the history of neoliberalism as it has evolved out of what was there, what was before, but in in North America and, and Western societies. But I I want to I think maybe ground this in what was there before before, and you know I think that um, one of the things that I want to do is really contrast um, the economic and system and the society that we have today with um, uh, the societies that existed here prior to contact. And I think it's a great contrast because when we're talking about what it is that we, what is comes next, I actually think that the, um, the project that we're doing right now on reconciliation uh, can go a long way to informing us about what is next. Because if there is something that is opposite to 
neoliberalism and individualism, that would be indigenous worldviews. And I and I want to just stop here because I'm in the process of reading Jody Wilson Raybould's new book, uh, um, Reconcile the the second sorry, um, True Reconciliation. I'm actually listening to it on my on my uh, headphones as I ride my bike into into work in the mornings, um, which gives me a, a good hour chunk at a time. And and I, I want to say that. Most of what I'm going to say here today has been organized simply because Jody's been walking us through this in her new book. And if you want to know more about this, I invite you to go to a local bookstore, uh, an independent local bookstore, uh, someone who's really slogging it out, and go and buy Jody Wilson Raybould's latest book, True Reconciliation, because it will give you more context to what we're talking about here or what I'm talking about. But first of all, I need to just say, my name is Tsahana. My father's name is, is Carl, uh, Sylvia to the main. My mother's name is Sylvia. Zikwat, Telquilum, Laura, or Phyllis, and Don, Thanasitla. Those are my grandparents. Laura Olson, Ernie Olson, Don and Phyllis Snowblum. And that's three generations. I, I could go back a further generation. And they talk about seven generations thinking. And um, Jody really frames this in the book. Three generations back, the current generation you're living in and three generations forward. One of the things that neoliberalism absolutely does not do and encourages you to absolutely abandon any thought of the three generations that are to come. But we are connected to our ancestors in our current culture. We, we, can, we can all, we can do ancestry.com, go pay hundred bucks, drop blood, go, it'll tell you what your ancestry is. What we do not do in our modern society is connect ourselves to the three generations to come. Those are our descendants. They are, in many indigenous cultures, including the one I am, they are as, even though we cannot see them and we cannot name them and we cannot, and, and we cannot, they're not there, they are not there in the same way as our ancestors are not there, but we are, we, we cannot deny that we are connected to them, the ancestors. So we need to, I think, recognize that this is a, about a different worldview entirely. Um, and uh, so, so that's the seven, seven generations uh, thinking. I think one of the things that Jody Wilson-Raybould does pretty well, and, and something that I know about, and, and uh, Justin and, and Liz have talked about this, is the flow of money. Um, and I think that I can I can really you know draw a strong analogy. The flow of money in in indigenous worldviews largely a collective societies. When Margaret Thatcher questions whether society exists, indigenous cultures recognize that the individual is um, a a necessary part of a collective. But their value is in their. Uh, connection to and their relationship with that collective. And so um, through potlatching called uh, ceremonies and through other ceremonies here on the coast, when there were those that didn't have any anything, we would go through um, um, elegant redistribution, wealth redistribution ceremonies that took a little bit from a bunch of people and, and gave it to those that didn't have any. My dad remembers, to, and he remembers to this often, he often tells me about this when we're coming in from fishing, and, and he would say, you know, um, you, need to, you need to take this fish, or you need to take part of this fish, and you need to go give it to somebody, uh, go give it to so-and-so, they, you know, they could use some, and that's the, what his dad taught him, they'd come in with, with some blue, you know, some, um, some coho or something from the Saanich Inlet, and They'd put it on a stick, and my dad would be run up to to one of the houses to to go and give some to the another family that was in need. There was there's always been a, a redistribution of wealth. But finally, I'll just say this: one of the other ways that it's very different that I, they the two could not be even this um, considered to be in the same uh, ecosystem or universe. But um, 
and I'll, and I'll do this by telling a story. My, my grand, my, my nephew, my dad's grand grandson, um, my, my sister's son, uh, Jack and Felix, there's two of them. And, and they, uh, they go they're they're they like to go fishing and hunting with my dad and they're out in uh, hip waders standing in the middle of gold stream and they're my dad's showing them how to spear fish and to net fish from right in the right next to the creek or to the river there one of the little arms that come off and there are a couple of uh, guys that my dad knows uh, older guys are like in their 50s or 60s compared to my nephew who's seven felix uh he's like his uncle he's got a really big mouth but anyway he's standing there in his hip waders in a net and he's you know tiny little guy and there's uh some indeed first nations guys from up in couch and they my dad knows them and they're talking away and um they're my dad and his grandsons go to turn to leave and felix turns around and he goes you remember eh you only take what you need right that's what he said to these two guys and I think in that, we've always been taught to leave the places we go better than we found them. First of all, that's like antithetical in, in the idea of neoliberalism. They, neoliberalism only leaves landscapes and places in far worse shape than they found it. And you only take what you need. You're not, you're not taking, there, there was no bank or capital like that. Uh, we uh, exist today. And so um the inheritance and the value of the place was the ability to go back there and harvest again and so it really required there to be a a philosophical and world view that required you to be good stewards of a place and to look after it and that again is is the opposite of what neoliberal produce i mean neoliberalism as an as a contrast produces clear cuts right um so you know and 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 um and you know, like clear cuts are are the stupidest thing that you can think of. It's it, it from a from a wealth, uh, from from a, a, a I think a performance uh, you know aspect. They're great economic performance. They're great, but from a long term viability, they're terrible. So anyway, I, I think you know I yeah I'll leave back to you, Joanne. <laughs> no, you know what I think what you've given us is the contrast, and I mean. You don't even have to say, well, then how did the growth of neoliberalism, starting with colonialism and the growth of neoliberalism, suppress that? Because we couldn't get to neoliberalism if we were still living with that philosophy of running uh, our lives. So Justin and maybe Liz want to comment on that. You know, so Justin, when you hear uh the worldview uh the indigenous worldview that adam has just put forward you know seven generations take what you need we are individuals in a collective i mean how different is that from neoliberalism I mean, those two seem so far apart you wonder if they could ever find uh room for each other well sorry just i just wanted to say this there is a reason why when that philosophy at it, you know, in its in its infancy, before it became neoliberalism, yeah. all of these economic philosophies were already in development. Yeah. The Hudson's Bay Company, let's not forget the first chief factor of, of the colony of Vancouver Island uh, was the first, uh, sorry, the, the first uh, governor of Vancouver Island was a corporate man. His name was D James Douglas, and he was he was a Hudson's Bay guy. He, he wasn't a he wasn't a politician. He wasn't yeah. a political appointment that didn't have interests. He was a, here to extract resources and to make the best uh, amount of money that he could possibly get. And so there is a reason why the Canadian state and the BC state went on a rampage to absolutely disrupt everything about indigenous cultures and disconnect them from the resource harvesting areas uh, to the point of not recognizing their sovereignty in their land uh, because the worldview was seen to be savage in compared to like um, you know undeveloped uh, uncivilized compared to the civilized economics of crowns and um, resource extraction to with the with absolutely no care for the because 
you know, they were they were colonists. They were just going to the next place and destroying that place too. So, okay, now over to you, Justin. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> okay, Justin, take a shot at what you've just heard and put it in some context from what you're hearing. You're on mute. You're on mute there. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot actually going on there, and I really appreciate uh, uh, the the two points that Adam made. Um, the second one is essentially, you know, it's a reminder that not everything is neoliberal. Like a lot of these things come from before, right? Like the history of colonialism was a lot older than the history of neoliberalism. But one of the interesting things about neoliberal thought is that they constantly appeal back to those those sort of original liberal arguments that Adam actually talked about in terms of like, you know, uh, indigenous governance, indigenous forms of governance and, and economic systems are not civilized, yada, yada. That's right out of Locke, right? That is right out of John Locke. That is embedded in liberal thought. And they constantly like to say, we, well, we've lost this great liberal tradition. Um, so in that way, it does it does tie back. The other thing that I thought was really interesting that he said was just was talking about this alternative, this alternative that hundreds, thousands of years old, which is a great reminder that this isn't it, 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 this isn't a natural state of being, right? The, 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 one of the things about neoliberalism that Liz and you have both mentioned is that it essentially makes itself to seem inevitable. Um, natural and undeniable and that is simply not the case like the history of humanity the, the idea of a, a market existing on its own outside of the social the political and the cultural is only a couple hundred years old right like that it is it, it, and it, it it didn't just happen naturally states worked the, the hudson's bay company was chartered by the british state right it was the governments and states created the conditions to allow for that sort of economic system um, um, to flourish. And I'll, that is one of the things that is important about any story that involves alternatives is that what seems natural and inevitable isn't necessarily, and certainly this system is not. And the other thing that came, you know, when I, I heard Adam talking, you know, I was just struck by, as you say, John Locke giving the language that was then used by uh, those who are colonizing, our current economic paradigm uses language exactly the same way. I mean, we talked about tax relief, which Liz mentioned. You know, I can, we were all turned into taxpayers, not citizens, for the longest time because they didn't want us to think of, of enabled citizens. We just had to be the taxpayers that wouldn't be taken advantage of. Liz, when you hear Adam speak about that, Op, that alternative, another way that existed and what did very well. What did, what's your reaction to it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it is it, to me it is it is almost the opposite. <laughs> you know, it is completely opposite. I think that for me, neoliberalism is something that has a total disregard for anything other than the individual. There is no concept of the environment in well, there's no, actually no concept of the environment in neoclassical economics. And neoliberalism puts GDP growth on steroids. And basically, you know, the World Bank and those sorts of institutions, they're saying we need to have 3% growth per year, which I think means that by 2050, we should have a doubling of the economy, which means that we have to double the resources we extract, which means that we have to uh, double the amount of pollution we create, the garbage and everything else. And so the, the thing that really, that I think Adam said that really strikes home is that, you know, if you're thinking three generations ahead and you think about what's the world going to be like three generations down, down the road. I mean, I have a grandson. My grandson was born in uh, 2019 and I looked it up at, at when he was born, his life expectancy was 81 years. So he can expect to be alive in the year 2100. What's it going to be like if we carry on? Is it going to be here? You know, I think that's a fundamental question. But so for me, the way that the indigenous thought about three, gen uh, three generations ahead is so important in the way that we're thinking. 
you know, it, it just, it, it brings it home when you start to think about how much destruction has been wrought by GDP growth. And, and I think, you know, we have to say GDP growth was uh, a target long before neoliberalism came along. It did put, um, it, it did put uh, growth on steroids. Um, I think that's probably uh, very self-evident, but I feel that, I feel that we, it's that lack of looking forward. It's that delusion that somehow or other we live on an infinite planet. You know, the saying, um, anyone who believes that infinite, that uh, exponential growth is infinitely possible on a finite planet is either a madman or an economist. And this is, this is the absolute truth that we have to face up to is we live on a finite planet and neoliberalism does not acknowledge that. So, Adam, I mean, you know, we should take a look at, at the environmental impact of this. And I will just put in a plug for next week. We will have Bill Reese here, who is talking about overshoot, about the fact that we are not recognizing the limits of growth. But let's talk about the political realities of this, Adam. And since you're the politician who's here tonight, um, the minute you say to someone, uh, from the other parties oh well no you know we have to think three generations ahead we're going to leave stuff in the ground we're not going to do the you know what the answer is the answer is that'll kill jobs that uh, we will not be able to pay for this every no one's going to stop driving their car you, you've heard the arguments what do you say back to that how do we start to change that story well i mean i i don't think that i can uh I think the only answer that I can give you is that the the political system that we exist in, where um, my day of reckoning is sometime in 2024 or before, yes, um, that produces some um, very very uh, devastating and and challenging uh, or a, a challenging environment to work in. Uh, when you take a look at most uh, CEOs, their their lifespan is what four, five, six years, something like that. So, you know, they're maximizing their outputs every quarter, and so, um, you know, they're they're looking in three month increments, not three generation increments. In politics, we're looking in four year. Uh, if if we're lucky here in BC, we're looking at four year uh, increments where the day of reckoning comes four years from now. So the idea of thinking three generations from now is, um, is, is something that we're not afforded the, the time and space to be able to do in, if we are gonna continue to operate in those legislative, in, in those parliaments, the way uh, that they are currently structured and the, the way that, that we do. You know, I would also say that, you know, like, the, the idea of an indigenous worldview is so far from neoliberalism that we don't even view ourselves in the context of individual humans. We exist at an equal to the bugs and to the uh, other mammals and to the fish and to the stars and to the sand and to the trees and to all the plants. We are but one part of the ecosystem we are and and we ex view ourselves as existing within that ecosystem and so when you do that you know if you change your mindset of viewing yourself as within the ecosystem um then you you start to think about how you exist in that ecosystem differently than the way we do now we, we separated the need to exist in the ecosystem um you know through technology to a great deal so we don't have to worry our minds about that, although we have to worry our minds about a whole bunch of other stuff that comes uh, from it. So, you know, when I stand up in the legislature and talk about my relatives, the state, no, I'm Quilnoch, I'm human, Quilnoch. Our relatives, the state, no, right? The salmon people, I'm a human person, the salmon people, I've done this a lot in the legislature. It just goes goes right through them but i'm being very deliberate we are relatives they are transformed from humans from Quilna. so you know it's a it is a completely different worldview but when i talk about it 
I don't get people like um, contacting my office and saying, you're a kook. Like, what is, what is going on with you? Like, what is your problem? In fact, you know, I, I seem to get a fair amount of political support, at least in my writing. And so it's not that it's foreign for people to think about it. In fact, when I talk to people about it, they're like, it makes them feel comfortable that I'm talking about this context. What's uncomfortable is the context that they're currently living in. And I think that that might be part, has to be part of the new story is that actually people are really uncomfortable in this neoliberalism, neoliberal. Yeah, those who get to be able to benefit from it benefit a lot, but that's not everybody. That's a, that's a small percentage. That's a good question. And, and Justin, I'm gonna put that to you. You teach students uh, who have an interest in politics or they wouldn't take political science. Are you hearing from them a, a question about what else, what other systems are there? Because certainly a number of students must be feeling that they're getting left out of the system, that the system is not created for them. Um, what are they telling? What, what questions do they have? I mean, they're they're on point on this stuff for the most part. I mean, it's a... <laughs> It's, it's not a representative sample, uh, particularly <laughs> the students, you know, who go into political science um, and those who come to my class, you know, but <clears throat> um, the students that I do see um, are deeply informed. They don't have, oftentimes they don't have, again, the, the lexicon to understand neoliberalism and where it comes from, which is why I teach it. But, um, you know, on issues of social justice, they are almost uniformly um, far ahead of where I was at their age um, on issues of decolonization and reconciliation, whatever word we want to use that will, you know, somehow become co-opted by the state, but um, they are on point. Um, they understand innately I think that students in BC and on the island with the, with the cost of living um, and the, you can't ignore open air homelessness in, you know, in downtown Victoria or in Vancouver. Um, they know innately that there are, you know, economic inequalities that go along with the in, other inequalities that they're really well versed on. But again, they don't necessarily have, um, um, that lexicon and they are looking for alternatives and I think uh, frankly I have not I you know I've been teaching for six or seven years now and the uptick in students who are coming to my classes who are you know avowed socialists it, it, I've never seen it before so that you know and whatever we think about that particular system and that particular alternative I think it just speaks to the fact that they are certainly interested in something that is different because when they are you know they're 19 20 21 years old um they've lived their entire life through crisis and so the idea that there could be something different or better are, and sometimes they're a little bit resentful that they've been left such, such a, a a fractured earth and fractured society and so um i do think that they're uh they crave something different um sometimes they can be cynical but i, I as as a whole, in general speaking, I, I find them uh, quite uplifting, actually. Well, that's good to hear. And I I think, uh, Adam, you would, and, and Liz, I share that. I, what I sometimes find when I'm out talking to uh, young people about democracy and the world around us, they may have lost faith in the system, but they know the system should be different. And I think, you know, I look at my own children, they live a better ecological footprint than I did at their age. They, they have a sense that it's not just all about the individual, but we are having some trouble mm, harnessing it, telling them that there is something different and helping them connect to it. Uh, that might be part of the discussion as we go into our breakout groups. We have had, I think, a quite an invigorating <laughs> excitement about what is neoliberalism how do we get here what are you know we we look at the indigenous worldview that um we've ignored for so long in the non-indigenous world and um i think we're we're now trying to deal with how do we get back to something that is not 
unlimited growth. That is not, uh, it's all about a market. It's all about the individual. Like, I mean, how do we deal with those issues? Because they're real issues. Our language has been set up to make that the way of thinking. I mean, there's, it's not an accident that our systems and our governments are running on neoliberalism. Um, <clears throat> so I think, Liz, we're about to now go out into our breakout rooms. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> chance for all of you to talk about some of these things. Uh, they're going to be hosted. So each of the breakout rooms should have a host from the policy committee. Thank you to the policy committee members for agreeing to host the groups. Thanks for taking everyone's time. Um, I was I was drawing upon the the term crisis and and was hoping to sort of problematize the word we and and problematize um, where we locate crisis, which is often we talk about. Um, you know, now we are in crisis. And I'm worried about that term because I feel like it often occludes the historical fact that um, colonized people have lived through or not lived through apocalypses that have already been done. And I, I want to problematize the word we um, because uh, there are um, and have always been people um, that have never prescribed to the neo-colonial way of being, to the neoliberal way of being, but have always been in resistance. And those resistances draw upon um, ancient ways of being. And these ancient ways of being pre-exist to the current world and by practicing them, resist it. Um, and so, to the final question that our group was looking at was what do we what would we wish the green party to um to perhaps more deeply embody and practice and for me i would like to see it draw together those connections between um between uh between racism between um between uh uh um uh, white supremacy and abolition and decolonization, um, those that all of those systems of oppression that ultimately the the so-called ecological crisis that we now all are in um, is the symptom of systems of oppression that have that have long been operating. Um, so thanks for your time. Sorry, everyone. Thank you, Javni. Uh, you're on mute, Liz. Thank you, Javni. Who muted me? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know it was possible to mute me. Uh, so, um, thanks, Javni. Whose group were you in? Who, who was the... Alex. Who was, pardon? Alex's group. Oh, Alex, okay. Well, Alex, we'll leave you till last because I think we've just heard, heard a lot of your group. I'm going to start off with Farouk. Can you just give a quick summary of the main points that you heard in your group discussions, please? Well, thanks, Liz. Uh, it was a wonderful engagement uh, and I got to uh, got a lot of great recommendations. Uh, the first thing was there's nothing positive about <laughs> neoliberalism, okay? Uh, and the illusion that it creates is immediate production which justifies, you know, that's means, but of course, all the all this just stuff that happens, we all know. Um, I guess one of the bright spots that our group noted uh, with respect to, uh, you know, efforts is the youth. And I think engaging them and their own, uh, you know, as, as was shared, their higher enlightened state of being, you know, with respect to, you know, the modern state of affairs and how they're, looking at this crisis, owning it and, and working with them would be a great way forward. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, um, uh, the notion of uh, how do we actually have uh, a story that is alternative and it gets challenged is to, is to take a stand and plant those ideas no matter what. Because, you know, we are all, typically change happens always in the minority. And the thing is that it's to note that, you know, very interestingly, neoliberalism also took hold in a time of crisis where it was presented as the solution of, you know, and, and taken up. It was also in the, so I think the, 
the the point of resistance is actually at, at this stage uh, unfortunate as it is and speaking to again what was shared earlier all the oppression has that has happened but at this point is a point of intervention where we can really you know go out with the new end uh, finally, I think what was what emerged out of that was this discussion about what we can have a sort of an alternative form of a new form of socialism because we discussed that capitalism or any any of the form of neoliberalism has to be abolished. And in that, what came about was a discussion of how NDP is different from the Greens ah. and, and highlighted one key value, uh, which I think was re which resonated uh, and, and people also shared this is that the, the deep wisdom of ecological wisdom where we all are connected. And so in that we can sort of try to uh, enlighten people or at least uh, involve them in trying to understand our new story, which is which is not a new story at all, is that we're all connected and that we need to look at, uh, you know, systems that are that are sustainable and stuff like that. So, uh, that is what you know was offered as a and and I, I think the the Thank real you. challenges the real challenges of course the people are brainwashed they 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 have capitalism on, and neoliberalism in their mind but to persist with that story is something we saw as as something really productive. Thank you. Thanks, Farouk. Uh, I'm going to go to Leslie next. Okay, thank you. Um, so some of the main ideas discussed in our group were just beginning by appreciating having the opportunity to learn the vocabulary that's correct and be able to articulate both the history and the current problems we're facing um, using this vocabulary. Um, but that about that brought about a concern. How can the average person come to understand this? How do we go out with this message and this new knowledge in a way where we can be understood and um, actually make connection with others? Um, can we bring about hope for a better life without causing fear of what we are losing um, in order to do so. So there's one thing. Um, there was lots of discussion in our group about housing, concern about land ownership, concentrating wealth in the hands of few. So our discussion led to returning land to public ownership and establishing things like land value taxes to discourage the current trajectory towards what looks like a feudalistic system. Um, class conflict came up as a topic that we um, discussed, so we could have perhaps try to help the middle and the lower classes understand that they probably have more in common with the homeless than they do the top 1% at this point um, to help understand where that wealth is accumulating and how it's affecting all of us. Um, a suggestion to perhaps get away from using that GDP growth model. We talked about degrowth a bit, so it's good that that's coming up next in our series. Um, GDP obsession with growth is destroying both society and environment. So we could instead focus on a happiness or a well-being index, perhaps. Um, and it was suggested that this might be a focus for the Green Party before the next election. Maybe this can be part of our messaging. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Leslie. Um, next, Will. Well, Will is, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, we all got to know each other very well. I realize now we spent probably half the time introducing one another. Um, although it was still nice to meet everyone. Um, so uh, again, no, I don't think we saw any positives. Um, I think we remarked on um, how this inability to understand that our resources are finite just continues to astound um, and to some in our group has never made sense, which I, I really appreciate hearing that. Um, as well, sort of in the vein of class, of the classes and, and class solidarity, um, specifically management came up in the context of, of um, the, uh, sorry, cross streams or, or I forget the, the phrasing now, um, and how they sort of occupy this this unique space in our in our concept of the classes. And um, I think we we sort of brought that to a conversation on the interesting uh, or the fact rather that anyone who's been educated on, in business or management or any of those things in the past 50, 75 years has been learning the exact same things. And that was the world is a jungle, um, you know, being a self-made man and if you oppose those things, you're 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 a long-haired hippie or a communist. And so I'm summarizing, but that was pretty close to where we ended on that one. Um, a lot of our conversation went to the the actual language that we're using. Um, you know, neoliberalism is an an academic uh, 
conversation. I, th I think one that in our group we said can really alienate people from our messaging. Um, we said, or someone in the group said that we need to focus, focus more on the urgency and the needs of, of people and, and their immediate um, desires. And someone built on that with a sizable sample size, I'll say, of door knocking and said that in their experience, hope is no longer getting them very far on the doorstep. And what is currently getting them on the doorstep is addressing people's fears. And what they said was hope is a luxury and what people need is relief. And I that resonated a lot with me. So I, I think that was a direct quote. I did my best. Um, and then we brought it to a discussion of age, um, you know, that that our peers are already trying to tell a different story. Sorry, my my peers and um, those younger than me are trying to tell a different story. So maybe if we just give it some more time and we, we get more of my generation uh, in, in places of power and additionally lower the, uh, the voting age. And so last thing I'll say to that last part, somebody had an idea of some homework. I'll pass it to the larger group that in David Eby's newest uh, position, maybe he's a little more flexible to the voting age. So we should all go and email the premier's office to lower it to 16. And maybe if they get 100 emails, and we don't say that we talked about it here, he'll think that there's a massive spur of, of uh, people wanting a lower voting age. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Great. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will. Did you say you were running? <laughs> Didn't say you're going to go to the office. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't say that. Okay, Judy, you're next up. Thanks, Liz. Uh, we had a great discussion too, and a lot of it overlaps, so I won't make it super long. Uh, we talked about some of the barriers and challenges to shifting from neoliberalism, and some of those included our lifestyle expectations. We still expect to consume so much forever. Um, the fact that three generations of voters have never known another system, so they lack the language to question neoliberalism and even be aware of alternatives. Uh, the pressures on families these days to work long hours to make ends meet. Uh, some of the media slant, erosion of public services, uh, the electoral system, very competitive approach in schools and sports some of the, the downsides, some of the barriers, but then we talked about solutions and some of the things people pointed out were that we can't go in with a theoretical or sort of grandiose approach of overthrowing neoliberalism or capitalism, but we need some pragmatic solutions and solutions that don't depend on individuals and some of these being very targeted and clear. We had quite a bit of discussion about uh, the need to have more public spaces and public goods available. And the more of that that's available, that would start to help shift views to the value of that. And uh, along with that shifting priorities in budget, uh, someone also made the suggestion that we need to, as a party, to share the successes of Greens in other countries. Because sometimes we just look within Canada and say, well, what are they accomplishing? Whereas in other countries, some amazing things are going on that we could let people know about. And of course, engaging youth. In terms of a new story, um, we talked around again about how we could use budget to support more public goods, more public spaces, things like more better health care, a true service economy, uh, more public lands, for example, protecting forests, embracing First Nations land back. And uh, then we also talked about how pay scales should reflect what jobs are really valued, for example, nurses that we value very highly, but don't pay that well. And finally, we talked a little bit about how the story that we tell should differentiate ourselves from the NDP, perhaps to more emphasis on degrowth economy, sharing, and to show actually that the NDP do come from a neoliberal approach, because sometimes that isn't very clear to people. So that was about it. It was a great discussion. Goodness me, you went through an awful lot there. Um, I, I, my group, um, we talked uh, about a lot of the things that uh, you've already you've already uh, mentioned here. Uh, a lot of a lot of discussion about how neoliberalism has emerged from um, from liberalism in the nineteenth century as it, as it began, and you know how it was a uh, liberalism was you know progressed through the twentieth century, and then um, the neoliberal advent of 
the, the neoliberal version of things is just uh, what was described actually as a, a, a perverted extreme version of liberalism. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things our group was very, very focused on was the fact that we are in overshoot, what we, we have unsustainable ways of thinking, even though uh, it could be said, and there was a bit of a debate about, are we better off materially because of neoliberalism or are we not better off materially? And uh, some, the, the answer to the question about, uh, you know, was that a good thing about neoliberalism? Well, the answer that the neoliberals would give you was that uh, everybody was better off. But then again, if you look at the, the degradation of the planet, if you look at the homeless, the difference between rich and poor, we're not necessarily better off. Um, I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of comments about materialism uh, and the fact that a lot of what, a lot of what uh, we are enjoying now, enjoying in inverted commas, is because of fossil fuels, because fossil fuels have enabled the expansion of the economy. We talked about the loss of community and the fact that there's a void inside uh, for a lot of people, which they make up by uh, buying stuff. And um, <clears throat> we, then we went on to talk about, can we tweak neoliberalism to, to uh, make it work properly? And the general consensus was that we cannot, that neoliberalism cannot deal with the climate crisis. Um, and the general feeling was that it was maladapted and it was destined to fail. And what we've tried to, what we've tried to do is to adapt the planet to us rather than humans adapting to the planet. Um, again, you know, we noted that there's this huge need for a cultural shift, but it was also pointed out that, um, uh, you know, bringing about this, talking about this, is politically dynamite and that you know there was the comment that you can be right or you can be elected and those two things uh, are a, a, a difficult balancing act so i think uh, i think that was um, that was a, uh, a reasonable summary of what i managed to write down notes on because i'm a bit slow uh anyway i'm going to go back to alex and say alex was there a quick thing that you want we've got two minutes uh, before so i can do the wrap up but have you got a quick thing that you want to uh want to say because i okay I'll, I'll try and be brief um one interesting thing that could be construed as positive about neoliberalism is the fact that it managed to elbow its way past alternative narratives and come into existence and, and dominance although if you look at consequences, it'd be hard to demonstrate that that's actually a positive. Um, in terms of um, remedies, we, we, I think we agree generally on a combination of, of individual tweaking of particular um, worst outcomes, um, maybe in, in, in some kind of social democratic regime, um, but generally aiming for a gradual replacement with alternative narratives uh, and values. Um, and we uh, concentrated on strong, resilient communities, co-housing was mentioned. And, and what came out repeatedly was the metaphor of a drug addiction that, and how do you combat that in an individual? Perhaps we are facing a similar situation at the um, much larger level. Um, what Green's policies could do to address all this and promote alternative narratives First of all, address the education deficit. Um, we, we started out from the premise that the general public don't know very much about neoliberalism. So there's clearly a deficit there. Um, strengthen cooperativity, communitarianism in terms of values, but also in terms of politics, policies. Um, the fact that cooperatives still tend to lose out in competition with neoliberal uh, organizations, that needs to change. And that there needs to be some selective in strengthening going on from the top down. Um, sounds to me like a good, good policy. Um, and lastly, strengthen cooperation in a more general term. Uh, the fact that cooperating, cooperating is not advertised as the thing to do rather than succeeding and, 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 and out competing. And, and there's a, a language thing there as a teacher that appeals to me a lot. Um, and, we, and we can start with changing that language. 
back in preschool. Okay. I think that was it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And I would like to thank everybody for being here and the contributions. Sounds like we've all had some really wonderful uh, conversations today. Again, another quick reminder that our next session is coming up on Tuesday, February the 21st, when Professor Bill Reese will be talking about the degrowth debate. And as I said, this promises to be a really interesting session. And I think it will, it will follow up on from this very, um, very well. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. If you have any questions or comments about this series, send them to our policy team at newpolitics at bcgreens.ca. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Justin Leaf. So again, you can follow him and his work on Twitter. Uh, and um, I'm hoping that uh, that will be put into the, uh, the, uh, the chat so that you can actually see that. That's uh, twitter.com, Justin life so life so is how it's pronounced oh, sorry um and uh, that's justin l-e-i-f-s-o and uh, also you can look him up on the ubic website so thank you everybody i look forward to seeing you on tuesday this has been a fabulous conversation and uh i have looking forward to the next one thank you very much indeed bye-bye okay. thank you all